Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 44 <coughs> of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam Kento 4. And we are in chapter 20 of the fourth canto. Chapter 20 is titled Lord Vishnu's appearance in the sacrificial arena of Maharaj Prithu. And we're starting from verse 26. So there's every likelihood that, because we're almost, we're, we're fairly close to the end of the chapter, so I would say it's pretty unlikely that we'll spend an hour maybe half an hour or so anyway let's see how it goes first of all let us chant our prayers Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nir Vishesha Shunyavari Pascha Chadesha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramunitya Ananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gora Bhaktivrinda <coughs> Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakalpa Charibhyas Chakripa Sindhubya Eva Cha Paditanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai uh, Verse 4th Canto Chapter 20 Verse 26, my dear, highly glorified Lord, <clears throat> if one in the association of pure devotees hears even once the glories of your activities, he does not, unless he's nothing but an animal, give up the association of devotees, for no intelligent person would be so careless as to leave their association. The perfection of chanting and hearing about your glories was accepted even by the goddess of fortune, who desired to hear of your unlimited activities and transcendental glories. So there's a couple of paragraphs here. How many paragraphs? There's three paragraphs, okay. So Srila Prabhupada first of all refers to Arya Sangama, which means the association of devotees. It is the most important factor in the world. Arya refers to those who are advancing spiritually. You may remember we discussed about Arya, the Aryans, Aryans, a little while ago. <clears throat> and it's, it's all about people who are advancing spiritually, the Aryans. So, so the Aryan families all over the world, and sometimes it's known as Indo-Aryan. Before, before in the distant past, prehistoric days, all members of the Aryan family followed the Vedic principles and became spiritually advanced. The kings who were known as Rajarshis were so perfectly educated as Kshatriyas, protectors of the citizens. And they were so advanced spiritually that there were no troubles for the citizens. Krishna, when oh when will that day possibly come for us? We've got a long way to go. So, okay, on to the second paragraph. And again, Prabhupada talks to some degree. Well, he talks about the Aryans. The Aryan family. Uh, they, they really appreciate glorification of the Lord. And even though there's no bar, no bar for anyone, they, everyone is welcome to participate and become devotees and advance, but still the Aryan family, they quickly catch the essence of spiritual life. So Prabhupada raises an interesting question. It's really interesting. 
So how is it that Americans and Europeans are taking it up, taking it up so easily? History, you know what the history is like. History tells us that the Americans, well, it begins with the Europeans, actually. They were very good at colonizing. Oh, yeah. Forcing themselves on other people. But now being contaminated by science, their sons and grandsons are becoming degraded. It's all because of, of losing their original spiritual culture, which is Vedic culture. Yeah, these descendants, Prabhupada's referring to the Americans and Europeans. Descendants of the Aryan family are taking Krishna consciousness very seriously. Those who associate with them and who hear the chanting of Hare Krishna from their lips, the lips of pure devotees, they also become captivated by the, the sound. So these this transcendental sound vibration is very effective when chanted by Aryans. But even non-Aryans will become Vaishnavas. They do become Vaishnavas just by hearing the mantra because the mantra is just so powerful and so special. So now onto the third paragraph, Prithu Maharaj makes the point that even the goddess of fortune, who's the constant companion of Lord Narayan, specifically wanted to hear the glories of the Lord. And in order to get the association of the gopis, who of course are the most elevated pure devotees, our goddess of fortune Lakshmi did severe austerities. And impersonalists may ask, why should you bother chanting Hare Krishna for such a long time? Why not just stop everything and try for Kaivalya liberation merging? into the existence of the Lord. So in response, Maharaj Prithu says that the attraction of the chanting is so great, people can't give it up unless they're animals. That's Prabhupada, really. Uh, Prithu Maharaj, very powerful. So this is the case. Even if somehow you get into chanting by accident, by chance, Prita Maharaj is really emphatic about this. Only an animal can stop chanting Hare Krishna. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, those who are not animals, but who are actually intelligent, advanced, human, civilized people, cannot give up this practice of continually chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Very nice. Wonderful. On we go to verse 27. <clears throat> now I wish to engage in the service of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and to serve just like the Goddess of Fortune who carries a lotus flower in her hand. Because His Lordship, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the reservoir of all transcendental qualities. Yes. I'm afraid that the Goddess of Fortune and I would quarrel because both of us would be attentively engaged in the same service. Well, anyway, that's what a amazing, really amazing way to put it all. So again, this is a big purport. It's four paragraphs. Here, uh, the Lord is addressed as Akula Purushotama. 
Akila Purushottama, which, well, what supreme personality of Godhead, um, Lord of the entire creation, Purusha. Purusha, of course, means the enjoyer, and Uttama means the best, certainly the best. Um, Akila. In the word for word, we see that Akila means all inclusive. Yes. Right, okay. So, anyway, there are different types of Purushas or enjoyers in the universe, mainly three types, Prabhupada says. Those who are conditioned, then those, those who are liberated, those who are eternal. Okay, in the Vedas, the Lord is called the Supreme Eternal of all Eternals. Nityo Nityanam. Both the Lord and us are eternal, but the Supreme Eternals are Vishnu Tattva. Yeah. Lord Vishnu and his expansions. So Nitya refers to the Lord, beginning from Lord Krishna, then to Mahavishnu, Lord Duran, etc. And Brahma Samhita, Ramadi Muratishu, says there are millions and trillions of expansions of Lord Vishnu, Ram, Nrsinga, Varaha, etc. And, and they're all called eternal. So on we go to the second paragraph. Prabhupada explores a little the term mukta. Mukta, Prabhupada says, mukta refers to living entities who never come to the material world, whereas the badhas are those who, who almost eternally live in the material world almost eternally and they they struggle they struggle to become free from the threefold miseries yes so so they can enjoy life whereas the muktas the muktas are already liberated they never come here so Lord Vishnu is the master of the material world. No question of him being controlled by it. And therefore he's addressed here as Purushottama, the best of all living entities, whether, whether Vishnu Tattva or Jiva Tattva. So Prabhupada says it's a great offense to, he says, compare Lord Vishnu and the Jiva Tattva but really what, what he's saying is that to consider them, Vishnu Tattva and Jiva Tattva, to think they're on the same level. Yeah. The Mayavadis equalize the Jivas and the Vishnu Tattva, the Lord, and think that they're all one. And this is just, well, Prabhupada says it's the greatest offense greatest offense. So now there is a third paragraph here in the purport. Let's have a look. Prabhupada begins the paragraph by saying, here in this world we have practical experience that a superior person is worshipped by an inferior person. So similarly, the Purushottama Krishna, Lord Vishnu, is always worshipped by others. Prabhupada makes the point that Prithu Maharaj therefore decided to engage in the devotional service of Lord Vishnu. Yes, because he, he's Shakshavesh. He's an incarnation, of course, that we, we know very well already. Maharaj Prito is an 
an expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a, an incarnation, but he's Shakyavesh, he's not Vishnu Tattva, he's Jiva Tattva. So another significant word here is Gunalayam, Gunalayam, which means Lord Vishnu is the reservoir of all transcendental qualities. Mayavadis, of course, say the absolute truth is near guna, has no qualities, but this is, this is the impersonal perspective. Actually, he's the reservoir of all, of all good qualities and transcendental qualities, yes. So Prabhupada makes the, the point that one of, one of his most in, important qualities is his inclination towards his devotees. Therefore, he's called Bhakta Vatsala. And the devotees, of course, they, they love to serve his lotus feet. And the Lord is very inclined to accept their service. In this way, there are many transcendental transactions, uh, interactions in those exchanges. And they're called transcendental qualitative activities. Interesting. So then Prabhupada tells us, lists out, right at the end of this paragraph, he lists out some of Lord Vishnu's transcendental qualities. Let's just quickly go through them. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent, all-pervasive, all-powerful. He's the cause of all causes, the absolute truth, the reservoir of all pleasures, the reservoir of all knowledge. He's the all-auspicious one, and so on. There, there are so many. That takes us then on and into the fourth paragraph. So Prabhupada, the way Prabhupada puts it is that Prithu Maharaj wanted to serve the Lord with the goddess of fortune. That does not mean he is in Madhurya Rasa. The goddess of fortune serves uh, Lord Vishnu in Madhurya Rasa, conjugal Rasa. Um, and although, interesting point, although her position is on the chest of the Lord, she likes to serve the lotus feet of the Lord. And Prithu Maharaj himself, he was thinking only of the lotus feet of the Lord, because he's in Dasyaras, the relationship of servitude. So the next verse, let's just see what is said in the next verse. It will tell us Pritu was thinking of the goddess of fortune as the universal mother, Jagan Mata. So there's no question of him competing with her in Madhurya Rasa. But still he was afraid she might feel offended by how he's engaging in the service of the Lord. So, so this suggests that in the absolute world sometimes there's competition between the servants of the Lord, but it's always without malice. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying <clears throat> in the Vaikuntha worlds, if a devotee excels in the service of the Lord, others do not become envious of his excellent service, but rather aspire to come to the platform of that service. Isn't that nice? That is real. Vaikuntha consciousness. 
So on to verse 28. Yes. Right. So, my dear Lord of the universe, <clears throat> the goddess of fortune Lakshmi is the mother of the universe. <clears throat> and yet I think that she may be angry with me because of my intruding upon her service and acting on that very platform to which she is so much attached. Yet I am hopeful that even though there is some misunderstanding, you will take my part, for you are very much inclined to the poor, and you, and you always magnify even insignificant service unto you. Therefore, even though she becomes angry, I think that there's no harm for you because you are so self-sufficient that you can do without her. Okay. So yes, the, the, the goddess of fortune is well known for always massaging the lotus feet of Lord Narayan. She's the ideal wife because she takes care of her husband in every respect. Not only his lotus feet, but his household affairs also. She cooks nicely, fans while he eats, puts chandan on his fa face, sets his bed, his seating. And like this, she's always engaged in his service. And no other devotee can intrude in these regular daily situations of her service. Pritu Maharaj, who felt almost certain that, that he was intruding and that this would irritate her and she'd become angry with him. But then again, why should, why should she, the mother of the universe, be angry with an insignificant devotee like him? Yes, this is not very likely. But still Pritu appealed to the Lord for personal protection. He was doing the ordinary Karmakandiya material types of uh, worship. But the Lord was so kind he was ready to give him the highest perfection means devotional service. So the thing is, and this, of course, we know very well, when a person performs the Vedic rituals, Karmakandiya, those sacrifices, he does this to, to elevate himself to the heavenly planets, the material heavenly planets. And nobody becomes qualified to go back to Godhead by doing that. But the Lord is so kind, he accepts even small service. So Vishnu Purana says that, for example, by doing Vanashram, one can satisfy the Lord. And when the Lord is satisfied, you become elevated to devotional service. So Prithu was expecting that his small service to the Lord would be accepted, even as greater than the service of the goddess of fortune, Hare Krishna. So that's, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Oh my Lord. That's what Prabhupada says. So the goddess of fortune is called chanchala or restless. She's coming and going from one devotee to another and back to the first one. Coming and going, restless, not like really fixed. Flickering, chanchala means flickering. So Prithu Maharaj indicated that even though she might go away out of anger, there'd be no harm for Lord Vishnu. He's self-sufficient, he doesn't need, he doesn't need anyone's help, doesn't even need her help. For example, and this is just, this is a, a good example. When Gaba Dakshai Vishnu begot Lord Brahma, he did not take help from Lakshmi. She was there massaging his lotus feet. 
And of course, generally to get a son, the husband has to impregnate the wife and then the son comes. But here, Gaba Dakshay Vishnu didn't have to do that because he's self-sufficient. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Therefore, Prithu Maharaj was confident that even if the goddess of fortune became angry with him, there would be no harm, neither, neither for the Lord, neither for himself. Verse 29. <clears throat> Great saintly persons who are always liberated, take to your devotional service, because only by devotional service can one be relieved from the illusions of material existence. Oh my Lord, there's no reason for the liberated souls to take shelter at your lotus feet, except that such souls are constantly thinking of your feet. So here we have a purport again. The Prabhupada begins by pointing out that, you know, the other groups, the Karamis and Gyanis, the Karamis, they're engaged in fruit of activity. The Gyanis, they are disgusted by, with their search for material comforts. They understand they have, they have nothing to do with the material world because they're spirit souls. Aham Brahmasmi, that's the Gyanis. But after that realization, there's another step. They have to surrender to the Lord. As Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 verse 19 makes very clear, Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sadulabaha. So therefore self-realization is not complete unless you come to the devotional platform. So therefore Srimad uh, Bhagavatam says that those who are Atmarama or self-satisfied they're free from all the contaminations of the modes. As long as you're affected by the modes, particularly passion and ignorance, you'll be greedy, you'll be lusty, and therefore you'll work hard day and night to fulfill your desires. And this false egoism takes you from one species to another perpetually. There's just, there is no rest in any, any species. The Gyani knows this, so he stops working and takes to, Prabhupada says, takes to Karma Sanyas. And there's another per, uh, paragraph here, that even to do that is not the actual platform of, of satisfaction. After self-realization means impersonal self-realization, the jnanis' material wisdom leads them to the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Then he becomes satisfied by constantly meditating, contemplating on the lotus feet of the Lord. So therefore, Prithu Maharaj concludes that the liberated people who take to devotional service, they have reached the goal of life. If impersonal liberation was the end, there'd be no question of them taking to devotional service, giving up their liberation and then entering into the process of devotional service. So, in other words, the pleasure from self-realization, uh, from Atmananda, means impersonal realization, is insignificant compared to the bliss of devotional service. So, Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Prithu Maharaj therefore concluded, that he would simply hear of the glories of the Lord constantly <clears throat> and thus engage his mind upon the lotus feet of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. Verse 30, my dear Lord, what you have said to your unalloyed devotee is certainly very much bewildering. 
the allurements you offer in the Vedas are certainly not suitable for pure devotees. People in general bound by the sweet words of the Vedas engage themselves again and again in fruit of activities, enamored by the results of their actions. Prabhupada refers at the beginning of the purport to, to how Srila Naratam Das Thakwa. He says that people are very much attached to the fruit of activities of the Vedas, both particularly Karma Kanda, but both Karma Kanda and Jnana Kanda. They are certainly doomed. Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda, what is it? Kevala Vishira Banda. They're poison. So Prabhupada explains um, there are three types of activities Karma Kanda, fruit of activities. <clears throat> Jnana Kanda, philosophical research, and Upasana Kanda, worship of different demigods for getting material benefits. So those in Karma Kanda and Jnana Kanda are doomed in the sense that anyone who's trapped in the body, whether that of a demigod, king, or animal, is doomed. The sufferings from the three, threefold miseries are the same for all, demigod, king, lower low animal, or whatever. So, cultivating knowledge to understand your spiritual position is also a waste of time, at least to some extent, because the thing is we're parts and parcels of the Lord and our business is to do devotional service and not merge or just sort of be some other exist in a certain state, but to be actively engaged in devotional service. And Preto Maharaj says the allurement of material benedictions, just another trap to entangle us in the material world. So he's telling the Lord, frankly, you know, that your offers of such benedictions, they're just causes of be be bewilderment. Pure devotee is not interested in bhukti or mukti. Right, so there's a second paragraph here. Sometimes the Lord offers a neophyte such benedictions. If they haven't understood yet that material things won't make them happy. And Prabhupada refers to Chaitanya Charitam Rita, in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead says that a sincere and unintelligent sincere devotee may ask for material things, but the Lord doesn't give it, but rather takes things away, so the devotee ultimately surrenders. So in other words, offering of benedictions is, I mean material benedictions, is never auspicious for the devotee. And the statements in the Vedas about elevation to heaven by doing sacrifices, it's bewildering. So therefore, Prabhupada refers to Bhagavad Gita chapter 2 verse 42, which says that the less intelligent are attracted by the flowery language of the Vedas and they engage in fruit of activities um, to become materially benefited and just continue life after life searching. Yeah. In all different bodies. Verse 31. My Lord, due to your illusory energy, all living beings in this material world have forgotten their real uh, constitutional position and out of ignorance, they're always desirous of material happiness in the form of society, friendship and love. Therefore, please don't ask me to take some material benefits from you. 
But as a father, not waiting for the son's demand, does everything for the benefit of the son, even without the son asking, please bestow upon me whatever you think is best for me. This is really nice. Very wonderful prayers. Right, so, Prabhupada explains, it's the duty of the son to depend on the father without asking anything from him. Because the good son has faith that the father knows best what's good for me. So similarly, pure devotees don't ask for anything material from the Lord or even, even anything for spiritual benefit. The pure devotees are just fully surrendered. The Lord takes charge as, anyway, the Lord takes charge. Yeah, as, as Bhagavad Gita 1866 Sarva Dharman Paritya Jamam Ekam Sharanam Vraja Aham Twam Sarva Pape Bio Moksha Shami Mashuchaha. As the Lord says there. So the Father, of course, knows the necessities of the Son, supplies them. Lord does the same with the devotee sumptuously. Oh gosh, sometimes too sumptuously. So therefore, the Ishapanishad says that everything in this material world is complete. Problem is that due to forgetfulness, the living entities create unnecessary demands. They become entangled. And as a result, there's just no end to material life for them. So, okay, now the second paragraph and it's it's really short, so I'm just going to read straight through. Before us, yeah. there are varieties of living entities and everyone's entangled in transmigrations and activities. Our duty is simply to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead and let him take charge, for he knows what is good for us. Then third paragraph, which is also short. So Maharaj Prithu tells the Lord that as the Supreme Father, you can just give whatever you think will be the best for me. And Prabhupada says, that is the perfect position of the, for us, for us. Lord Chaitanya Prabhupada quotes, um, Shikshastakam verse 4, Nadanam Najana Nasundarim, Kavitam Va Jagadisha Kamaye, Mama Janmani Jamanishvare Bhavatad Bhaktir Ahwetaki Twayi. And translation Almighty Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth, nor have I, nor have I any desire to enjoy beautiful women, nor do I want any number of followers. I only want your causeless devotional service in my life, birth after birth. So then the fourth paragraph, also very, very short. The conclusion is, pure devotees should not aspire for any material benefit from their service. Nor should they be attracted, enamored um, by fruit of activities or mental speculation, should just always be engaged favorably in the Lord's service. That's the highest perfection of life. So devotees, on we go to the fourth section, verse 32 to 34. Lord Vishnu responds to Prithu's prayers and then departs. Let's just have a look here, yes, so we'll read through the verses first of all. Verse 32, the great sage Maitreya continued by saying that the Lord, the seer of the universe, after hearing Prithu Maharaja's prayer, addressed the king, <coughs> my dear king, may you always be blessed by engaging in my devotional service, only by such purity of purpose as you yourself very, very intelligently express, 
can one cross over the insurmountable illusory energy of Maya? Verse 33. My dear King, O protector of the, set, the citizens, henceforward be very careful to execute my orders and not be misled by anything. <clears throat> Anyone who lives in that way, simply carrying out my orders faithfully, will always find good fortune all over the world. 34. The great Saint Maitreya told Vidura, the Supreme Personality of God, he had amply appreciated the meaningful prayers of, of Maharaj Pitu. Thus, after being properly worshipped by the king, the Lord blessed him and decided to depart. Right, so back to 32. The great sage Maitreya continued by saying that the Lord, the seer of the universe, after hearing Pritu Maharaja's prayer, addressed the king. My dear king, may you always be blessed by engaging in my devotional service. Only by such purity of purpose as you yourself very intelligently express can one cross over the insurmountable illusory energy of Maya. Yes, okay, so purport, short purport. Bhagavad Gita also confirms this, that Maya is insurmountable. Daivyesha gunamai mama maya durachyaya. It's Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 verse 14. And Prabhupada refers to it further. No one can transcend maya by fruit of activities, speculative philosophy or mystic yoga. The only way to transcend maya is by devotional service, as the Lord says in 7.14. Mam eviye prapajyante mayam etam tarantite. So therefore the devotee shouldn't care for any material position be it in heaven or in hell. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, a pure devotee should always engage in the service of the Lord, for that is his real occupation. Simply by sticking to that position, one can overcome the stringent laws of material nature. 33. My dear King, O protector of the citizens, Henceforward, be very careful to execute my orders and not be misled by anything. Anyone who lives in that way, simply carrying out my orders faithfully, will always find good fortune all over the world. So, okay, there's another fairly short purport that, first of all, the sum and substance of religious life is to carry out the orders of the Lord Anyone who does this is perfectly religious. And the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, says in Bhagavad Gita 1865, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto, just think of me, become my devotee. Then in 1866, uh, Sarvadama Paricha Jamami Kam Sharanam Raja, just give up all kinds of, Prabhupada says, material engagement and simply surrender unto me. This is the primary principle of religion. So anyone who does this um, is re a religious person. Others are pretenders. And there's so many things going on in the name of religion which are not religious. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, for one who executes the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, however, there is only good fortune throughout the world. Verse 34. The great Saint Maitreya told Vidura, the Supreme Personality of Godhead amply appreciated the meaningful prayers of, Pri of Maharaj Prithu. Thus, after being properly worshipped by the king, the Lord blessed him and decided to depart. So Prabhupada says here in the purport that the most important thing in this verse are the words Prati Nindyartavad Vacha, Vacha, which indicates the Lord appreciated Pritu's prayers. 
So when a devotee prays to the Lord, it's not for material benefit, but to ask the Lord for, for the favor of being engaged in devotional service, birth after birth. And therefore Lord Chaitanya says, Mama, Janmani Janmani Shvare, birth after birth, let me, let me engage in service. So the Lord and his devotee, they, they may appear in this material world birth after birth, but these births are transcendental. And we see, in, for example, in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Bahuni me vyatitani janmani tava charjuna. The Lord says, the Lord tells Arjuna that both of us have taken many births before. I can remember them all, but you can't. So the Lord and his confidential devotees appear many times to fulfill his mission. But since these births are transcendental, there are no miseries, birth, death, etc. So they're called transcendental. So therefore, next paragraph, we have to understand the transcendental birth of the Lord and the devotee. The purpose, purpose of the Lord taking birth is to establish devotional service. And the purpose of the birth of the devotee is to broadcast that bhakti all over the world. Prithu Maharaj was an incarnation of the power of the Lord for spreading bhakti. And the Lord best, uh, blessed him to remain fixed in that position. So, so when, when Prithu refused material benediction, Lord appreciated that very much. Then there's another significant word, which is achuta, which means infallible. That although the Lord comes to the material world, we must never think he's one of the conditioned souls who are all fallible. Because when he comes, he remains in his spiritual, uncontaminated, infallible position. And this is described in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 6. He comes, Atma Mayaya, by his internal potency. He, being infallible, he is never forced to take birth. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, he appears in order to reestablish the perfect order of religious principles and to vanquish the demoniac influence in human society. So devotees, here we come now to the last section, five, from verse 35 to verse 38, Prithu Maharaj worships all the great persons who then return to their abodes. And I guess, yes, we're going to have to read the verses first, so no problem. First of all, verses 35 and 36, King Prithu worshipped the demigods, the great sages, the inhabitants of Pitriloka, the inhabitants of Gandharva Loka and those of Siddha Loka, Charana Loka, Pan Panaga Loka, Kinara Loka, Apsara Loka, the earthly planets and the planets of the birds. He also worshipped many other living entities who presented themselves in the sacrificial arena. With folded hands, he worshipped all these as well as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the personal associates of the Lord by offering sweet words and as much wealth as possible. After this function, they all went back to their respective abodes, following in the footsteps of Lord Vishnu. Verse 37, the infallible Supreme Personality of Godhead having captivated the minds of the king and the priests who are present, returned to his abode in the spiritual sky. Verse 38, King Peter then offered his respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
who is the supreme lord of all demigods. Although not an object of material vision, the Lord revealed himself to the sight of Maharaj Prithu. After offering obeisances to the Lord, the king returned to his home. So, okay, let's go through the verses again and their purports. King Prithu worshipped the demigods, the great sages, <clears throat> the inhabitants of Pitriloka, the inhabitants of Gandharva Loka, and those of Siddha Loka, Charana Loka, Panaga Loka, Kinara Loka, Apsara Loka, the earthly planets and the planets of the birds. He also worshipped many other living entities who presented themselves in the sacrificial arena. With folded hands, he worshipped all these, as well as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the personal associates of the Lord by offering sweet words and as much wealth as possible. After this function, they all went back to their respective abodes, following in the footsteps of Lord Vishnu. So uh, let's have a look at this purport then of verse 30, what is it? 35, 36. So in the modern scientific society, Everyone, of course, thinks there's no life on other planets. Only here do living entities have intelligent scientific knowledge. Vedic literatures don't accept this foolish theory. Sorry, scientists. The, rather, the followers of Vedic wisdom are aware of different planets inhabited by varieties of living, living entities like demigods, sages, pitas, gandavas, panagas, etc., in fact, the Vedas say that all the planets in the material and spiritual worlds have varieties of living entities. Spiritually, they're all one in nature, but in quality, they're one with the Lord, with varieties of bod bodies different arranged by, di by different arrangements of the material elements. And they have varieties of intelligence too. The earth is just one planet in the Burlog Loka system in the middle, more or less. There's six systems above, seven below. So this universe is known as Chatru Dasa Bhuvana. Yes, Chatur, not Chatru. Sorry about that. Chatur Dasa Bhuvana. Fourteen different planetary systems. But beyond it is another sky, Paravyoma, the spiritual sky. Then there, there are spiritual planets. And the inhabitants there on the spiritual planets engage in devotional service in five main rasas. Dasya ras, Sakya ras, Vatsalya ras, Madhurya ras, and above them all, Parakya rasa. Okay, devotees, let's not, let's not get confused about that. Right, that's interesting. Parakya rasa is prevalent in Krishna Loka, where Krishna lives. That's also called Goloka Vrindavan. Now, of course, Parakya rasa generally is, is a part of Madhurya rasa, that would mean there's, there would be four listed, but then there's also Shantarasa, which is generally included as the first or lowest um, of the Rasas. Yes, neutral type of Rasa. So anyway, Krishna lives in Goloka Vrindavan perpetually, but he also expands in millions and trillions of forms. And in one such form, he appears on this material planet uh, in Vrindavanda. So Prabhupada, on this planet means, in this universe, on this planet. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, there he displays his original pastimes of Goloka Vrindavanda in the spiritual sky in order to attract the conditioned souls back home, back to Godhead. 
verse 37. The infallible Supreme Personality of Godhead, having captivated the minds of the King and the priests who are present, returned to his abode in the spiritual sky. Prabhupada makes the point that because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is all spiritual, he can descend here without changing his body. If you've got a spiritual body, you can also come to the material world. You don't need a space suit or some paraphernalia. You can just come. That's how Narada Muni goes up and down, spiritual world, material world, back to spiritual world, etc. Uh, so, so therefore he's called a tutor, infallible, the Supreme Lord. But when the living entity falls down here, he gets a material body. So therefore he can't be called a tutor. Because he falls down from his real position in devotional service, he gets a material body to suffer or to try to enjoy in material life. So the fallen living entity is tutor or fallen, whereas the Lord is a tutor, infallible. So here the Lord was attractive for everyone, not just the king, but also the Brahmins who were addicted to fruit of sacrifices. Therefore he's called Krishna, one who attracts everyone. He appeared there as Shiradakshai Vishnu, plenary expansion of the Lord, second incarnation from Mahavishnu, who is the origin of the material creation, and, and he has expanded from Gavadakshai Vishnu. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Shira Dakshai Vishnu is one of the Purushas who control the material modes of nature. Verse 38, King Prita then offered his respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supreme Lord of all demigods. Although not an object of material vision, the Lord revealed himself to the sight of Maharaj Prithu. After offering obeisances to the Lord, the king returned to his home. So Prabhupada makes the point in the short purport, the Lord generally is not visible to material eyes, but when the senses are engaged in devotional service, and then purified, then the Lord may reveal himself to the vision of, of some resident of the material world. Otherwise, he's avyakta, unmanifested. So, even though the material world is the creation of the Lord, he is unmanifested to material eyes. But the thing is, as we just read, Prithu Maharaj developed spiritual eyes by pure, devo by pure devotional service. So Prabhupada con concludes the purport and the chapter by saying, Here therefore the Lord is described as Sandarshitatma, for he reveals himself to the vision of the devotee, although he is not visible to ordinary eyes. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.